Well, good morning to you all and welcome to our service of remembrance on this Remembrance Sunday. Many of you, as I will be wearing today, a poppy. And several of you will know that there are wall graves here in our churchyard and we make the poppy and those graves part of our act of remembrance today. We begin with a poem that I found uh, written by Paul Hunter, a soldier who uh, uh, wrote this in 2014 for the Royal British Legion. It's a poem just simply entitled The Poppy. I'm not a badge of honour. I'm not a racist smear. I'm not a fashion statement to be worn but once a year. I'm not glorification of conflict or of war. I'm not a paper ornament, a token. I am more. I am a loving memory of a father or a son. A permanent reminder of each and every one. I'm paper or enamel. I'm old or shining new. I'm a way of saying thank you to every one of you. I am a simple puppy, a reminder to you all that courage, faith and honour will stand where heroes fall. So we've come into the churchyard and to one of our First World War graves. Uh, this is actually the grave of a sailor um, uh, uh, and um, uh, not many poppies grew at sea of course but poppies um, became um, a, a symbol of today uh, largely because during the First World War uh, much of the fighting took place in Western Europe and previously beautiful countryside was blasted and bombed and fought over again and again so that the landscape swiftly turned as I'm sure many of you will have seen from documentaries and other films to fields of mud bleak and barren scenes and places in which nothing could grow bright red Flanders poppies Papava roeas for those of you who are horticulturally minded were delicate but resilient flowers that grew in their thousands flourishing even in the middle of chaos and destruction. So it was that in early May 1915, shortly after losing a friend in Ypres, a Canadian doctor, Lieutenant Colonel John McRae, was inspired by the sight of poppies growing there to write his famous poem. McRae's poem inspired an American academic, Moira Michael, to make and sell red silk poppies, which were brought to England by a French woman, Anna Gerdin and the Royal British Legion, formed in 1921, ordered nine million of these and sold them on the 11th of November in that year. The poppies sold out almost immediately and that first ever poppy appeal raised just over £100,000. In 1921, that was an awful lot of money. This money was used to help the veterans from World War I to find employment and housing on their return. The following year, Major George Housen set up the Poppy Factory to employ disabled ex-servicemen and today that factory and the Legion's warehouses in Aylesford produce millions of poppies every year. The demand for poppies has been so high that few were reaching Scotland, so Earl Haig's wife established the Lady Haig Poppy Factory in Edinburgh in 1926. And Scottish poppies, if you've ever bought one, have four petals and not five, as do the English ones, but they're still made. And so um, we talked about um, um, John McRae's famous poem. It is, of course, in Flanders Fields. We hear it now. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place. And in the sky, the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from failing hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields.
and so to our first hymn, uh, an old one, one that's been sung, uh, I guess, um, right from the very beginning on this day. If you know it, you might join in at home. O valiant hearts, who to your glory came, through dust of conflict and through battle flame, tranquil you lie, your knightly virtue proved, your memory hallowed in the land you loved. Proudly you gathered rank on rank to war, as who had heard God's message from afar. All you had hoped for, all you had, you gave. To save mankind, yourselves you scorned to save. Splendid you passed, the great surrender made into the light that never more shall fade deep your contentment in that blessed abode who waits the last clear trumpet call of God Long years ago, as earth lay dark and still, rose a loud cry upon a lonely hill, while in the frailty of a human clay, Christ our Redeemer passed the self same way. Still stands his cross from that dread hour to this, like some bright star above the dark abyss. Still through the veil the victor's pitying eyes look down to bless our lesser Calvary's. These were his servants, in his steps they trod, following through death the martyred Son of God. Victor he rose, victorious too shall rise, they who have drunk his cup of sacrifice. O risen Lord, O Shepherd of the dead, whose cross has bought them and whose staff has led, in glorious hope their proud and sorrowing land commits her children to thy gracious hand. So from our First World War sailor we come to a Second World War soldier uh, as uh, uh, our uh, grave for remembrance here. Uh, warfare had changed a lot by the time of the Second World War uh, and the great war poets that blessed us with the words of that hymn and with In Flanders Fields were not so many. But there was one, Judge John Jarmain, who uh, wrote this poem about Al Alamein. There are flowers now, they say at Alamein. Yes, flowers in the minefields now. So those that come to view that vacant scene where death remains and agony has been will find the lilies grow. Flowers and nothing that we know. So they rang the bells for us in Alamein, bells which we could not hear. 
And to those that heard the bells, what could it mean? That name of loss and pride, El Alamein. Not the murk and harm of war, but their hope, their own warm prayer. It will become a staid, historic name, that crazy sea of sand. Like Troy or Agincourt, its single fame will be the garland for our brow, our claim on us a fleck of glory to the end. And there our dead will keep their holy ground. But this is not the place that we recall, the crowded desert crossed with foaming tracks, the one blotched building lacking half a wall, the grey-faced men sand powdered over all the tanks, the guns, the trucks, the black, dark, smoking wrecks. So be it, none but us have known that land. El Alamein will still be only ours. And those ten days of chaos in the sand, others will come who cannot understand, will halt beside the rusty minefield wires and find there flowers. The Second World War uh, uh, changed things very much at home. Um, our nation had not been greatly damaged at home during World War I in comparison to the effect of World War II. And so many lives, not just those who served, were turned upside down by that great conflict. And the end of the war did not mean the end of service nor of sacrifice for so many people. Three, almost four million British men and 400,000 women were demobilised, returning to their homes and families, some for the first time for many years. Feelings and emotions and challenges faced by that generation, while different in their causes and extent, have echoes for many today. Shortages of goods, feelings of social isolation, familial dislocation, a sense of and fear of the unknown, a feeling of being forgotten, the collaboration of nations and communities to face a common foe. And as the entire nation relied on our service personnel and public servants, in many ways so do we today. The Second World War threw up lots of issues to overcome for that generation. There was a need to rebuild as the world awoke from the horrors of that war, as nations and communities began to repair the damage. Tentatively rebuilding not only homes and buildings, but also economies and communities. And again in the wake of a global pandemic, in 1945, governments across the world faced huge challenges. Infrastructure, industry and transport links all had to be rebuilt. Accommodation found for millions left homeless and towns and cities pieced back together. And then there was the need of reuniting of communities, of families and friends. This was not something that could be achieved just overnight. It was to be a long pre uh, process and for many the end of the war did not mean the end of service nor the end of separation for their families. And many faced a long wait to be reunited. The end of World War II did not lead to the immediate reunification of families in Britain or throughout the Commonwealth. It would take months and in some cases years for, for reuniting uniting with loved ones and family groups as a whole. Demobilisation was postponed for lots of people and those returning returned to homes and families they hadn't seen and in some case returned to new places that they never even dreamt of. And for some who'd been injured or maimed or damaged by the war, an even longer journey of recovery. What was called for was a reimagination of what the world might be like, of great social change. And indeed, that was what happened. The most destructive war in history was a massive driver uh, of not just social change, but of technological, political and economic change. While we today see massive societal changes brought about 
by, for instance, the coronavirus that we're fighting at the moment in terms of how we work and communicate and travel and feed ourselves. So World War II had that same effect on people then in every walk and aspect of life. New families were created as women married servicemen of other nations and moved overseas. Children were born often in fatherless homes as dads didn't come back. There were all kinds of adjustments to be made. Marriages that had been strong and healthy at the outbreak of war fell apart because people had changed and times were different. And it was very hard to adjust to a different world view and in many cases just to adjust to a world at peace. Many people looked to settle in new nations. Commonwealth troops in great numbers emigrated to Britain. Jewish survivors of the Holocaust looked to move east and west to new homes in places like America. Polish soldiers, many of them, made Britain their permanent home and new social policies were to change the whole outlook of the world. A world that is broken, needed to restore beauty and community. And those words written about largely the conditions at the end of the war um, echoed to me as I, as I was reading them. Um, I, I got them from an article on the Royal British Legion website uh, and it reminded me that actually although now our foes may not be uh, armoured, uh, we are still fighting a war, not least against coronavirus at the moment. We need to restore something of the beauty and wholeness of God's creation in our world today. And that, as it did in those days, will require sacrifice. Which leads us to our second hymn this morning. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. Lord, in your suffering world, this is our prayer. Bread for the children, justice, joy, peace. Sunrise to sunset, your kingdom increase. Shelter for fragile lives, cures for their ills. Work for the craftsmen, trade for their skills. Land for the dispossessed, rights for the weak voices to plead the cause of those who can't speak. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain. Come, change our love from a spark to a flame. Refuge from cruel wars, Havens from fear, cities for sanctuary, freedoms to share. Peace to the killing fields, scorched earth to green. Christ for the bitterness, his cross for the pain. Rest for the ravaged earth, oceans and streams. Plundered and poisoned, our future, our dreams. Lord, end our madness, carelessness, greed. Make us content with the things that we need. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain. Come, change our love from a spark to a flame. Lighten our darkness, breathe on this flame, until your justice burns brightly again. Until the nations learn of your ways, seek your salvation and bring you their praise. God of the poor, friend of the weak, give us compassion, we pray. Melt our cold hearts, let tears fall like rain. Come, change our love from a spark to a flame.
And so, uh, again, with the church closed because of the latest lockdown, we're here for our act of remembrance and service in the church porch by, indeed, the memorial to those who fell uh, from Chelsfield in those two great conflicts. We begin with a prayer. Ever living God, we remember those whom you've gathered from the storm of war into the peace of your presence. May that same peace calm our fears, bring justice to all peoples and establish harmony among the nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So we confess to God the sins and shortcomings of the world, its pride, its selfishness, its greed, its evil divisions and hatreds. Let us confess our share in what is wrong and our failure to seek and establish that peace which God wills for his children. We hold silence for a moment. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who gives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Micah, chapter 4. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised up above the hills. People shall stream to it, and many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the, up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples, and shall arbitrate between strong nations far away. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall all sit under their own vines and under their own fig trees. And no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all the peoples walk, each in the name of its God. But we will walk in the name of the Lord our God for ever and ever. So we come to our final hymn. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal home. Beneath the shadow of thy throne, thy saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is thine arm alone, and our defence is sure. Before the hills in order stood, all earth received a frame. From everlasting thou art God, to endless years the same. A thousand ages in thy sight are like an evening gone. Short as the watch that ends the night before the rising sun. Time, like an ever-rolling stream, bears all its suns away. They fly, forgotten as a dream, dies at the opening day. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. Be thou our God, while troubles last, and our eternal home. And a reading from the letter of St James, chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. 
But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly and spiritual and devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. That isn't the usual reading we have at Remembrance Sunday, though it is one of those on the recommended list of readings for this time. But it seemed to me, as we reflect on the fact that for countless generations, war has never really solved the problems. And that today, although wars are very different, they're fought uh, uh, through uh, cyber uh, uh, electronics, they're fought through false news, they're fought through politics, uh, and they're thought, uh, fought through disease and other such things. Nevertheless, those words of wisdom from St James about being pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to yield and being merciful and without partiality or hypocrisy are words that challenge us just as much as they did those who had to rebuild our world after each of the major conflicts that we still principally remember today. So in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, stretch forth your mighty arm to strengthen and protect the armed forces. Grant them meeting danger with courage and all occasions with discipline and loyalty. They may truly serve the cause of justice and peace to the honour and glory of your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray for the leaders of the nations that you will guide them in the ways of freedom, justice and truth. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who bear arms on behalf of nations, that they may have discipline and discernment, courage and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our enemies and those who wish us harm, that you will turn their hearts to kindness and friendship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the wounded and the captive, the grieving and the homeless, that in all their trials they may know your love, comfort and support. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Most Holy God and Father, hear our prayers for all who strive for peace and all who fight for justice. Help us who today remember the cost of war to work for a better tomorrow. And as we commend to you lives lost in terror and conflict, bring us all in the end to the peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And join with me please in the words of the prayer that unites us all as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So let's remember before God and commend to his safekeeping those who have died for their country in war, those whom we knew and whose memory we treasure, and all who have lived and died in the services of the peoples of the world. And so we call the roll of honour from our own parish, remembering first those who died in the 1914-18 war. We remember George Akehurst, Maurice Asprey, Julius Bailey, Oliver Cork, Horace Chumley, Walter Cade, Edward Cade, John Collins, Albert Cornwall, Frederick Chexfield, 
William Dent, George Dolly, Sidney Davis, Garnet Davis, John Ede, William Fathers, William Finn, Herbert Game, William Golding, Thomas Graves, Stuart Miller Hallett, Thomas Hopkins, Wilfred Haslam, William Hills, James Hills, Harold Hazelden, Noah Hillman, Albert Hockham, Henry Jarvis, Henry Kimber, Ernest Marcel, John Marcel, Albert Miles, John Morrell, Arthur Morgan, William Morris, William Martin, Walter Matthewson, Harry Mins, George Pierce, Joseph Potter, Herbert Sewell, George Smallwood, Henry Scrivens, Andrew Simmons, Arthur Trim, Frederick Theobald, Percy Thorpe, David Waters, Thomas Wickenden, Frank White, and Frederick Wickham. And those who died in the 1939-45 war. Jack Arthur Boulding, William Beadle, Ernest Caton, Frederick Chapman, Edith Mary Chapman, Edward Clark, Lawrence Dolly, Aubrey Hutchinson, Alan Albert James, David Marr, Douglas Lewis Motton, John Desmond Needham, David Alexander Noel, Frederick Thomas Parrott, Horace Sampson, Frederick James Smith, George Edward Tapsell, Edward Alfred Wallace, Roy David Waters, Leonard Frank Weber. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them.
When you go home, tell them of us and say, for your tomorrow we gave our today. And so an act of commitment. Let us pledge our souls anew to the service of God and our fellow men and women, that we may help encourage and comfort others and support those working for the relief of the needy and for the peace and welfare of the nations. You might like to uh, join in each um, line of this prayer if I leave a short pause after I've said it. Lord God, our Father, we pledge ourselves to serve you and all humankind in the cause of peace, for the relief of want and suffering, and for the praise of your name. Guide us by your Spirit. Give us wisdom. Give us courage. Give us hope. And keep us faithful now and always. Amen. God save our gracious Queen, long live our noble Queen, God save the Queen. Send her victorious, happy and glorious, long to reign over us, God save the Queen. So God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth and all peoples, unity, peace and concord. And to us and to all God's servants, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us this day of remembrance and forever. Amen.